You're entering a world of spoilers here, dude. Am I the only one around here who hasn't seen this goddamn movie? Welcome to Diabolical, the show where four long-suffering friends dissect films' most dastardly schemes, then try to improve them. I'm your host, Ben, and this week's movie is The Big Lebowski. So, stretch out on your favourite rug, you know, the one that really ties the room together. And let's get diabolical. Once again, I'm joined by our panel of peril. Introduce yourselves and tell us what's your favourite Coen Brothers movie. I'm Adam, and my favourite Coen Brothers movie is Miller's Crossing. Good choice. Nice. A good choice. Craig here. My favourite Coen Brothers movie is The Man Who Wasn't There. Oh, that's, mm. that's nice. Hard to get hold of these days, that film. I'd see mm. Um, mm. Yeah, get it used. There's no new copies anywhere. Don't know whether it's anywhere on streaming. I've got it on DVD. Yeah, I've still got my old DVD. So if you want it, it's yours for 20 quid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name's Gaz, and my favourite Coen Brothers film is No Country for Old Men. That's very high on my list too. Yeah, I was torn between that and Miller's Crossing. I mean, honestly, you could throw a dart at a mm. big wall of Coen Brothers movies and you were getting a mm. good movie. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So The Big Lebowski is my favourite. Mm. But it's uh, it's followed very closely by Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? Mm. Mm. Yeah. I have a soft spot for that film. Mm-hmm. Which Coen Brothers movie are you going to slag off, Gaz? <laughs> I was going to say, the only films, not necessarily that they're bad, but the only ones that I wouldn't entertain in the conversation of what my favourite Coen Brothers film is would obviously be Lady Killers. Yeah. And Blood Simple, I'm not massively fond of. Oh, you do surprise me. I thought you'd say Intolerable Cruelty. I, I love, love intolerable cruelty. cruelty. So fucking great. <laughs> yeah, oh my, God. my laptop wallpaper is Hanks the Baron Krauss von Espy with his little dog. <laughs> that silly man <laughs> over there. <laughs> Are you Wheezy Joe? <laughs> <laughs> that film is excellent. I can't believe you don't like it. Did you guys see the Ballad of Buster Skaggs? Yeah. Mm. Nope. I love that. Yeah. yeah. It was initially supposed to be a series. Oh, right. Like an anthology series. Yeah. You can tell because it's quite disjointed, but I suppose there's a certain charm in that in how <laughs> disjointed it is at the same time. Later, they'll be competing for the title of this week's Most Diabolical. But first, let's take a closer look at this week's movie. Arguably the Coen brothers' best known work, The Big Lebowski was released in 1998, following the success of Fargo. But it was originally written around the same time as Barton Fink in the early 90s, which is when the film is set. Before we dive any deeper into the film, I'd like to share some titillating tidbits to take you all the way back to 1998. News of Bill Clinton's inappropriate behaviour with the Big Lewinsky rocked the world. (laughs) The US FDA approved the use of Viagra for Johnson dysfunction. Nice. <laughs> and everybody's favourite adult entertainment location tool, Google, was founded. The highest grossing movies of that year were Titanic, Armageddon, Saving Private Ryan, and There's Something About Mary, which proved once and for all that semen and hair is an intrinsically funny combination. Nothing from you there? you got to be pretty pleased, aren't you, after all giving me loads of shit about 1998 it's a shit year for movies I left some on the table for you right (laughs) (laughs) should have called it saving 1998 I've purposely not chosen anything from 98 for that reason (laughs) in the published screenplay for The Big Lebowski the dude is introduced in the stage directions as a man in whom casualness runs deep that man is played by Jeff Daniels, who embodies the perennial slacker Daniels? so completely. No. no, that's wrong, isn't it? Bridges. Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's not only me who makes massive errors. <laughs> <laughs> I would have watched the hell out of that, though. Welcome to a very, 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 very special club. <laughs> <laughs> Go again. In the published screenplay for The Big Lebowski, the dude is introduced in the stage directions, as a man in whom casualness runs deep. That man is played by Jeff Bridges, who embodies the perennial slacker so completely the genius of his performance is often overlooked. Upon release, many critics were quick to dismiss the neo-noir caper as self-indulgent and chaotic, 
which contributed to poor box office returns. Unperturbed, it has since spawned a religion, Dudism, with more than 450,000 ordained priests. Annual festivals in the US and UK where thousands of fans dressed in costume gather to celebrate the film. White Russian competitions and scores of fans so dedicated that they've inspired a documentary called The Achievers. Taking inspiration from Raymond Chandler's The Big Sleep and other noir classics, The Big Lebowski follows the dude as a case of mistaken identity embroils him in a mysterious world of millionaires, nihilists, rug peers and countless other ins and outs. Helped and hindered by his friends Walter, a Vietnam vet played by John Goodman, and the placid Donnie, played by Steve Buscemi, the dude tumbles onwards, piecing together the puzzle as a complex plot involving the apparent kidnapping of Bunny, the eponymous Big Lebowski's trophy wife, unravels around him. In the final confrontation, we learn that Bunny has returned home after visiting friends out of town without telling anyone. The dude confronts the Big Lebowski with the truth. He didn't really want Bunny back. Broke and unhappy with his wife's behaviour, he withdrew $1 million from his family's charity and planned to keep it for himself, pinning the disappearance of the money on the dude. At the close of the film, save for the loss of Donnie and a little dude on the way, the dude's life goes back to the way it was, with him having seemingly learned nothing along the way. In short, the dude abides. Now, before I ask you your thoughts on the film, we're going to have a little quiz, which I'm calling... Is this review about The Big Lebowski or not? I'm going to read some excerpts from real-life movie reviews. If you think the review is about The Big Lebowski, I want you to say, Fucking A, man. If you think the review is not about The Big Lebowski, I want you to say, This aggression will not stand. Understood? Understood. I think so. I mean... Fucking A, man. Wouldn't more appropriate line be like, that's just my like opinion, man, or something? Well, <laughs> when you do the Big Lebowski for your film, you can choose what you want, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> okay, the first, uh, the first review. The trouble starts with the plot. We lose track not only of plot devices, but of whole characters. Is that about the Big Lebowski or not? Fucking A, man. Fucking A, man. Um, this aggression will not stand. The review was, in fact, about The Big Lebowski, written by Alex Ross for Slate. A common complaint that I don't personally agree with, but there you go. Mm -hmm. I find it, I mean, it's a complicated plot, but it's not particularly Mm. difficult to follow. There's not large gaps between certain events happening. It's intentionally not made or cut in service of the plot, right? The plot is secondary to the... Yeah. character interactions yeah and, and like you said at the end nothing's changed mm. and in fact if you really look at it the the dude's status quo resets after every single scene yeah <laughs> just packs it well, the funny thing is like he doesn't do a lot to advance the plot at all it just happens yeah. around him right yeah, yeah it's just long to the right he's there to be sort of gently befuddled really isn't he yeah yeah, yeah. The plot <laughs> befuddles him is perhaps it befuddles the viewer the first time around yeah. Right. All right, the second review. A heart-tugging potboiler that is at once poetic, tragic, and cold as steel. This aggression, this aggression will not stand. stand. This aggression will not stand. Okay, you are correct. It is not about the Big Lebowski. A bonus point, a bonus point if you can name that film. Ooh. Yeah, it's Fatal Attraction, right? Any other guesses? From the cheap seats? A heart tugging <laughs> pot boiler that is at once poetic, tragic, and cold as steel. Pot boiler is why I'm thinking fatal attraction. Yeah, that's a good guess. <laughs> I'm going to say um, Casablanca. Right, what's your guess, Turner? Um, uh, Star Trek The Undiscovered Country. <laughs> <laughs> that classic heart tugging <laughs> pot, pot boiler. <laughs> I'm afraid none of you get the uh, the bonus point there. It's actually written by Andy Jones uh, for TNT Rough Cut, and he was talking about Titanic. Uh-huh. The next excerpt. It's an off-kilter thriller with a sad sack hero. Fucking A, man. Uh, fucking A, man. This aggression will not stand. This was written by David Denby, New York Magazine, and it was indeed about the Big Lebowski. Boom. Okay. 
Next one. We've seen this done before, but seldom so well, or at such a high pitch of energy. This aggression will not stand. Uh, fucking A, man. This aggression will not stand. This uh, review was written by Robert Ebert for the Chicago Sun-Times. Roger Ebert? And it, yeah. Yeah, it's Ebert anyway. Mr. Ebert. Mr. Ebert, Mr. Ebert yeah. has written this. Yeah. And it was, in <laughs> fact, not about The Big Lebowski. Oh. Can anyone guess what film it was about? And I'll give you a little hint. It's one we've covered previously on the podcast. Truman Show. Speed. Willow. It was, in fact, Speed. Bonus point oh. to Craig Morris there. I'm well in front now. I got all of them right and a bonus point. <laughs> I'm going to remove myself from the camp from this competition. <laughs> <laughs> Turn a rage quitting. Yeah, sorry, I'm not having this anymore. It's rigged. Stop the count and declare yourself winner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> all right, and then we'll go for the final excerpt. Although some of its parts are brilliantly executed and played by a terrific cast, the result is scattered, over-amplified and unsatisfying. Fucking A-man. Fucking A-man. Fucking A-man. It was indeed written about The Big Lebowski by Edward Guthman for the San Francisco Chronicle. I was waiting for Guthman. (laughs) There we have it. That puts Craig out ahead. I prepared a tiebreaker. Let's just do it for fun. How many times does the dude say, man? In the movie. Ooh, Closest wow. gets it. 147 times. Oh. The big old darts total, hey? I'm going to go lower. I'm going to say I'm gonna say 72 times. I said darts. I went fucking snooker, didn't I? Jesus Christ. <laughs> now I look a fool. <laughs> We've all got egg on our face today. <laughs> I'm going to say 82. Turner got it bang on the nose, so he's obviously seen this written down. Oh, yes! Uh, it's a- <laughs> Indeed, 147. <laughs> I've, got, I've got a few here. Um, would you like to know some of the other um, important words that are said and how many times they say it? Wait a sec. That is the equivalent of 1.5 times a minute. Yes. Well, there you go. Wow. Man. What other words you got there, Turner? The F word, or a variation of it, was used 292 times in the movie. Wow. Walter tells Donnie to shut the fuck up five times. And the word dude is used 161 times. Fucking lazy writing. <laughs> <laughs> the Coen brothers do love their repetition. <laughs> so what did you think of the film? Let's start with you, Turner. I've got to say, I think this is my favourite rewatch that I haven't seen for a while. That's including The Wrath of Khan, which I really enjoyed. The whole way I was just chuckling through it and I thought, have I laughed this much, like, constantly throughout the movie every 30 seconds or so you're just chuckling sometimes more than others i just thought it was fantastic from the very start and i forgot the start of it with sam elliott's silky smooth narration at the start as a stranger and everything i just felt happy after watching it that's great to hear are you craig yeah it never gets old i think i always get more out of it every time i watch it for instance this is the first time i've watched it on a really massive tv and uh never noticed before he has that poster of Nixon bowling in his apartment, which is really weird. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always like Cohen dialogue anyway. Uh, I think Gaz has, has got this as well. There's a book of short stories by Ethan Cohen called Gates of Eden. has a lot of that same kind of just really well-observed um, patterns of, of speech in it, you know, overlapping, stop-start dialogue. Uh, and this, out of their movies, does that probably better than any of the others. The scenes with them in the bowling alley when they're having a conversation, they're heightened, obviously, and they're theatrical. They do feel like they've been very deliberately written, but also just really well observed. Yeah, I think I know what you mean. I think the actors do such a great job with it. They make it feel very real. Yeah. It's snappy, isn't it, the dialogue? Yeah. It just it pings back and forth. It doesn't matter how theatrical it sounds. It's like a, a tennis rally, just bang, 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 yeah. back and forth constantly. And it's just, it's full of life. Yes. Like when we've talked about banter just being that kind of half beat off in other films. Yeah. I think this film nails it. Mm-hmm. You don't feel yeah. that it's it's forced at all. Yeah. yeah. The reviews that you read out, I mean, they seem quite mad, really. But when you think about it, the Coen brothers used to do this quite a lot. There's like a tonal whiplash from one film to the mm-hmm. next. Fargo is quite funny but it's also very serious and mm. emotional and heartfelt. Yeah. And then mm. you go from Fargo to The Big Lebowski, mm. which is basically a stoner, screwball comedy. Yeah. And you can kind of see why people reacted badly to it. I, I think it's fantastic. It's it's mm. an all-time great film. 
yeah. uh, like you say, top tier Coen brothers. Ben hinted at this earlier. It was supposed to come out before Fargo, but they yeah. waited because Jeff Daniels wasn't available. <laughs> Jeff Bridges uh, wasn't available. <laughs> at the time. Yeah, and John Goodman wasn't available either. He was doing Roseanne. Okay, that's right. Yeah. So that's the reason that they did Fargo first. Yeah. So that could have been, they could have reacted to Fargo badly, I guess. Mm. Yeah. But it's a hell of a, you know, it's a hell of a movie to direct. So we're like, oh, should we just make this one while we're waiting for those two to get their shit together? I think back in the day, they basically had a couple of drawers full of scripts yeah. uh, that they'd already written, basically, that were all ready to go. Wow. Um, so it was just a case of whatever mood took them and whatever actors they wanted that were available, because I don't think they ever go for their second choice, do they, the Coen brothers? They'd rather wait. Mm. Uh, they originally approached Marlon Brando to play the Big Lebowski. Hmm. God, that would have been brilliant. Yeah, it would have been interesting. And apparently uh, Mel Gibson was approached to play the dude at one point, but he just didn't take the offer seriously, apparently. Hmm. <laughs> so for, for me watching it, I just loved it. And I haven't seen it for a good eight to ten years. And all the way through, I was just thinking, why have I left it so long? Yeah, it's funny. Uh, the performances are amazing. I love that that we're as much a passenger in the plot as the dude. It's mm. just, it's yeah. just, it's just great. Yeah. yeah, and you know, it looks incredible as well. A lot yeah. of really cool cinematography, Roger Deakins, isn't it? And visual flourishes like the dissolve that leaves the bowling alley neon stars. Love it. I love that opening as well. It kind of messes with your expectations a little bit as you're coming in over the desert right you know you've got right. this kind of real western sounding voice and you think where's this taking me and then you see la mm. yeah. uh, so it's great mm. and then they introduce the dude and you don't need to hear anything from him you already know everything you need to know you see him open the, the carton of half and half sniff it and then go to pay for it with <laughs> yeah. a check check for 69 cents <laughs> yeah you yeah. already know who he is yeah. it's nice perfect my favorite shot from that opening is the bowling alley slow-mo opening credits with the guy with the tash he gets the strike and then it's like slow yeah. moving like swinging his arms back <laughs> yeah, and forth yeah. it makes me burst out laughing every single time <laughs> it's so good so you see some of the cameras they used to get those shots like they had the little remote control car camera to go down the bowling alley after the ball oh break. right yeah and they must have put a, a camera inside one of the balls for yeah. the for the dream sequence. I don't know about that, actually. I was wondering about that. It's too perfect, right? Well, just think that they slide, right? Because it's waxed alleyways. So the, the ball slides mm. as well as turns. So it doesn't turn as often as you think, mm. actually. Mm. So, but I don't know. Mm. I wonder if they just put yeah. a, a camera okay. in the, in, the, uh, in the finger hole or not. Or just put a fake finger hole over the top of the lens, maybe. Yeah, uh, perhaps. Yeah. What I was going to say earlier about um, the actors, I think a big part of it is that a lot of them have collaborated with the the Coen brothers before, um, and I think that familiarity is is evident. And then the ones that haven't have clearly been brought on board because the, the Coen brothers love them, and they must also be fans of them as well. So who are the frequent collaborators? So obviously you had Buscemi was in Fargo, Goodman was in Barton Fink. Um, John Turturro. Peter Stormer obviously was in Fargo as well. Yeah. John Polito. Mm. Uh, yeah, I forgot about him. He was in uh, Highlander and uh, he's done a yeah. bunch of Cohen movies. Uh, he's the other yeah. private eye. Oh, yeah. He turns up in Cohen stuff a lot. Is he in The Man Who Wasn't There? Yeah. Yes, yeah, right. he is, yeah. Yeah. He's the uh, dry cleaning guy. <laughs> right. <laughs> One thing I wanted to bring up is, did anybody else find it really weird that Maud wants to have a baby with somebody who's got the same name as a father? <laughs> <laughs> I suppose, yeah. Yeah, I think that's the only thing that shows any kind of link between the two of them is that they're, they're both opportunists. Mm. He's almost the first guy that comes along that she doesn't know. So mm. she's like, okay, he'll do which is similar to the way that the Big Lebowski approaches his relationship with the dude. Don't think either of them really mm. care that his name's Jeffrey Lebowski. It doesn't even factor into their thinking. Mm. They're just like, here's someone who's happened into my life that will suit my purposes that I can for use a while. to my benefit, yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. It's some schmohawk. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so now I'm going to ask you for your favourite line. But I'm going to ask you to choose just one. So I want you to think very carefully. I've got one. I didn't write it down verbatim. Well, that's we good then. Well, no, I mean, it's quite a long piece. It's, hang on. 
it's when the dude and John Goodman go to see the kid with the homework and he goes outside to smash the car up and he's just going this is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass do you see what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass this is what happens when you fuck a stranger in the ass over and over again. it's so good have you seen what they put on the censored version or no no <laughs> it's no. fucking genius no. instead of uh, obviously fucking a stranger in the ass it's this is what happens when you find a stranger in the Alps. <laughs> <laughs> what? Perfect. Right, that's there you go. That, that quote writes itself. <laughs> right, Turner, what have you got? At the start of the film, and he's he's got um, his ex-wife's dog. He says, "What do you mean, boy, bowling dude? I didn't rent its shoes. I'm not buying it a fucking beer. He's not taking your fucking turn, dude." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm noticing a theme here that they're they're all uh, John Goodman's oh, lines. Brilliant, he's so good, so good. Yeah, Craig. Well, from the same scene that Gaz chose, when they see Arthur Digby Sellers in his iron lung, <laughs> John Goodman asks his wife. He says, uh, "Does he does he still write?" And she says, "Oh no, no, <laughs> he has health problems." <laughs> <laughs> But I would like to share one more just Uh, because it ties into something else, which is kind of clever. Uh, Judge. Breaking the rules. Judge. I think uh, I'm going to give my favorite line first and maybe we can come back to it. Okay. So uh, my favorite line is is another another Walter line. (laughs) He says, I forget where it comes in the film, but he says, uh, I myself dabbled in pacifism once. Not in Nam, of course. <laughs> God, what was your other one, Craig? Well, it's not so much about the line, although it is a very funny line, but it's about what the line comes to mean. So, uh, obviously, the nihilists threaten the dude several times that they're going to cut off his Johnson. And uh, at one point, uh, Walter offers his sympathy to the dude, and the dude says, I don't need your sympathy, I need my Johnson. And Donnie says, what do you need that for, dude? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the reason it, it, I think it uh, is an important line in the movie is because, I don't know if you noticed, but the bowling shirts that the dude and Donny have don't appear to belong to them. The dude's had like, art written on it, and Donny's shirt on the back has Johnson written on it. And the nihilists do take his John because oh. they killed Donnie, right? So mm. Very good. Do me and Gaz get an extra favourite line now, being as crazy as two? No. <laughs> you could just direct your hatred at Craig. <laughs> but Turner, I will ask you first mm-hmm. which character do you identify with most? Oh, probably Walter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the constant mood swings, the uh, former military service. Yeah, he's got it all. Uh, if we lived in America, you would 100% be a libertarian. Shut the fuck up! <laughs> <laughs> You're out of your element, Craig. <laughs> How about you, Gaz? Uh, I'd probably be Donny, just constantly befuddled by everything <laughs> going on around him. <laughs> See, I, I just said, I just said, Uli, the nihilist, <laughs> nihilist, yeah. nihilist. Yeah. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's a good shot. Yeah, I would have said Brant, <laughs> just cheerfully putting up with everybody's crazy shit. And trying to guide everybody <laughs> along. How fucking awesome is Philip Seymour Hoffman in that role? Oh, Jesus amazing. Christ. Amazing. Yeah. Just like some of his little moves where he opens the door and bows oh. when he goes in and stuff like that. He's just amazing. <laughs> just touching his, his lapels yeah. and stuff. There was um, there was somebody um somebody else auditioned for that role of Brandt. He thought he'd done a brilliant job. He thought, oh, this is in the back for me. Never got a call back. Saw the film, saw Philip Seymour Hoffman do his betrayal and went, Oh, that's how you do it. Craig, which character do you identify with? Well, it's the dude, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the eternal slacker. <laughs> What's funny about the dude abides is that I am extremely tolerant, but I am not at all zen. So I like to be liberal and progressive, but I also lose my shit at stupid things, which I think is very dude. Like, he, he wants to be cool all the time, but he isn't. He, he will yeah. fly off the handle a lot. Between that and wanting the the quiet life, definitely a dude, you know. That's good. <laughs> if you could have uh, cameoed in this film, 
which minor character would you like to play the, the part of? Do you know what? I think uh, Larry Sellers, the kid who steals the car, because he gets to do a ton with his face and he does it so brilliantly. <laughs> oh, he's amazing. On. All he does is, is have a blank face and that conversation just turns like so quickly from like yeah. being quite quite cordial to, to obviously yeah. John Goodman smashing up a car shouting, This is what you get when you fuck a strange yeah. up the ass. <laughs> <laughs> so good. Uh, how about you, Turner? Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> just so I've got a reason to paint my toenails. <laughs> that scene would have gone a whole lot differently. <laughs> Tell us you'll suck our cock for a thousand dollars. No. <laughs> Gaz? It's got to be the Jesus, hasn't it? Yeah. Everybody <laughs> loves the Jesus. The old uh, pederast <laughs> uh, Latin American bowling star. Everybody loves the Jesus, but nobody wants to watch a spin off movie just about him. I was going to ask about that. Has anybody seen it? The Jesus no, no. rolls. I saw some reviews of it and the trailer and some clips of it, and I, and I thought. Do I want to revisit the Big Lebowski in this way? Don't think so. It's got a great cast. Yeah, John yeah. Turturro, obviously. Aud- Audrey Tattoo, Bobby Cannavale, Susan Sarandon, John Hamm, Christopher ooh, Walken, ooh. Pete Davidson. Yeah, yeah. Bunch Crazy. of people who like John Turturro, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about you, Steiner? Who would you be? Uh, I would like to be one of the nihilists, like one of the backup nihilists. <laughs> Flea. Hmm. Flea, yeah. Is it him who puts the ferret in the bath? Uh, Could be. He's there. I don't know if yeah. he does. I was got one other piece of triv that you might like to know, or you may already know. Um, it's about the dude's cardigan. Have you heard? Have you read about this? You heard about this? All right, Leno. <laughs> <laughs> the thick cardigan the dude wears is called a Pendleton Westerly. Initially churned out in like the seventies, nineteen seventy-two but then stopped like a decade later. But due to the movie becoming a cult classic, they started a new line called The Dude Collection. There's, I'll, I'll include the, the link so you can put it in the show notes and everything. Yeah, it really made me smile, so I think you should, you should definitely all have a look. Wow. So I was reading a little bit about the, the, the costume design. And um, because Jeff Daniels or Jeff Bridges or whoever played the dude <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> based a, a lot of... The character on themselves from <laughs> from the seventies, basically. Jeff Bridges went to his own home with the costume designer, and they picked out clothes <laughs> from his ward his own wardrobe. And so he was just going home in his own clothes at night and coming back. And yeah, he was. Um, didn't he go to the Cohen brothers? He read he read the script and goes, "Did you guys go to high school with me <laughs> or something like that?" <laughs> <laughs> Who he is based on is a a movie producer, right? Um, Jeff. He's actually called Jeff something. Dowd. Jeff Dowd, yeah. Jeff Dowd, I think. And uh, yeah. what was based on John Milius, which I always thought was really funny. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, you mentioned it, I remember that. <laughs> Looks like him. Yeah, he does look a lot like yeah. him. I do have some other highlights. A couple of visual gags. The first one being when he's being interrogated by the Beverly Hills police and he throws a mug at his head. (laughs) (laughs) The other one is, and this has got to be really hard to pull off, the car crash stunts are really funny. Oh, yeah. Like where these drops the joint and then, oh, it's so good. Yeah. Just the way way that the car tips up when it hits the thing is just really comedic to me. There's an art to a good car crash stunt, yeah. but there's a, a higher level of art to making that a visual gag because that was just great. Yeah. And then the only other thing that I wanted to mention that I don't think we've touched on so far is the soundtrack, which is just great. Mm. Obviously, they wanted to evoke a bit of the 60s and 70s in it, even though it's set in the 90s. But they didn't want to go too hard on that with the soundtrack, so not having like Grateful Dead and stuff. But then you get the, that awesome Kenny Rogers uh, just dropped in to see what condition my condition is. Mm-hmm. Oh, what, so what a great. song. Yeah. And, uh, so iconic. The other one, when when the dude first encounters uh, Bunny, is that song from Beavis and Butthead Do America. Woo, jam, woo, jam, jam. Da, 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 da. <laughs> yeah. Great. Do you know who was, uh, who was in the music department for, for that movie? Uh, no. We mentioned him on a previous podcast, I think. T-Bone Burnett. Oh, oh yeah. Who did the music for uh, True Detective. I think he's done... Oh, brother, where are they? few other things
So now I'd like to bring back a recurring segment that's had uh, the fans raving. It's called <laughs> My Favourite Name from the Credits. The credits roll at the end of the film. My favourite part coming up. I was excited. Gets down to big associate editor, Big Dave Diliberto. What a great name. <laughs> Loved it. But I thought there's got to be more. So on I went. And who do I see there in the costume department? The one, the only, Cookie Lopez. Are you joking? Oh, wow. No. Really? No. <laughs> what are well, the chances of that? She was the one going to Jeff Bridges' house. As if she was the key set costumer. Ah, she, she must have had a promotion. Well, no, because The Departed was after Big Lebowski. Oh, no, so maybe, okay, maybe she was demoted then. Maybe she did a shit film. <laughs> well, no, 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 because for The Departed, she was costuming DiCaprio, which I think is a promotion. Uh, yeah, I guess. Only so. if you're under 25 years old. <laughs> But I didn't stop at Cookie Lopez. No, on I went until I found the designer, Randall Ballsmeyer. <laughs> Randall Ballsmeyer, you are my favourite name in the credits. It was his job polishing the bowling balls. He was a designer. All right, tell me, what did you think of the villain's plot in the big Lebowski? It's good, isn't it? He takes advantage of a situation that's not necessarily under his control. Bunny goes away to see her friends to escape Jackie Treehorn, and he's like, uh -huh. I know what I can do here to get myself a bit of bunts, because I'm a bit short at the minute. Perhaps not the best thought through, since uh, she was always inevitably going to return. But, yeah. you know, you've got to, you've got to praise the gumption for just taking yeah. advantage of a situation. That's what I was going to say. The, the massive hole in it is that he obviously didn't know where she was or, you know, when she might show up. She could have shown up at any time, right? Yeah. Could have been the next day. Yeah. So there was a bit of a risk. And it is very opportunistic. It's very ad hoc and reactionary. It's not like a premeditated plan. Mm. So rolling with it, yeah, it's it's not bad. Yeah. He tries to kill two birds with one stone and fails. Tries to kill two birds with one stoner. Oh, oh very nice. Very nice. And for his opportunistic approach, I award him seven florets mm. of broccoli. Wow. Yeah. Not bad. Middle of the road. Lucky yeah. number seven. So this is the part of the show where our panel of peril compete for the title of this week's Most Diabolical. And with it, the honour of choosing next week's movie and hosting the show. Unhappy with the behaviour of his trophy wife, Jeffrey, the big Lebowski, takes her sudden disappearance as an opportunity to rid himself of her and secretly embezzle one million dollars in the process. But he ultimately fails. Gaz, what would you have done differently? If I ever wanted to get rid of my trophy wife while securing myself a cool million in illicit funds, I would take the following actions. One. It's an initial layout that may not be supremely affordable in the Big Lebowski's current parlous financial state, but I would invest in a sports wheelchair. Now, I used to be a mobility equipment salesman, and I can tell you from experience the model he would need is the X Pro ST1, which has dual hand controls that allow you to control speed via trigger and steering via raising and lowering each armrest. This wheelchair fucking rocks. Seriously, have a go. <laughs> 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 Two Ocean's Eleven style screen slide over with some jaunty music. Chunk. Contact Bunny's friends in Palm Springs and tell them that Jeffrey has some important news regarding her financial woes with Jackie Treehorn. Her troubles may be over, but the family home isn't safe. You need to meet in a secluded spot in the Hollywood Hills to speak where you know no one can possibly be spying on you. Give her the exact coordinates where she can meet you. Three. Have Brandt overcrank the motors on your brand spanking new X Pro ST1, giving them a max speed of 30 miles per hour. It might not sound like much, but I can assure you it's scary as fuck when you're in an open chair that you're essentially controlling with levers. Go for a little spin and enjoy the chair before meeting with Bunny. Four. Have Brandt disable the magnetic brakes and disconnect the steering pins from the wheelchair arms. Five. Meet Bunny in the hills. Then Jeffrey should say something along the lines of, You and I were never what you would call a match made in heaven, Bunny. But in my own way, I cared for you even as my trophy wife. I'm now man enough to admit that we should go our separate ways. But I have one request. Although I've always taken pride that my disability was no disadvantage, 
I'd like you to take a walk in my shoes, as it were. Big L gestures to the X-Pro ST1. Six, Ocean's 13 style screen slide over with jaunty caper music playing in the background. Title card reads, one month ago or whatever, as the big man takes out a $1 million life insurance policy on his betrothed. I don't expect to be cashing it in any time soon, of course. He laughs and smiles at the salesman, who should be played by Bob Odenkirk or someone. <laughs> Seven. The wheelchair careers off the edge of the Hollywood Hills as Lebowski excitedly whoops, Yippee! Yahoo! And Brant laughs awkwardly behind his employer. Perhaps he lets off some Parsi poppers to celebrate? The quietest of the celebratory bangs. In any case, two birds, one stone, piece of piss. <laughs> Very nice. Well... I'm going to ignore the fact that Brant is kind of in control of the uh, the technical aspects of this wheelchair and just say that, yes, he could do that. Fine. <laughs> I think the part where this plan falls down, Gareth, I'm afraid, is that it relies on a call to the friends in Palm Springs that the big Lebowski does not know exist. Or maybe he knows it exists, but he does not know Bunny went there. Yeah. Yeah, it does. I was hoping you wouldn't notice. <laughs> Could you apologise then, please? So sorry for wasting all of our time. So so sorry. <laughs> I've made the most egregious error. Also, taking out a life insurance policy is the classic error of every noir. Yeah, I say you took out a life insurance policy just a month ago. Yeah. Where would the big Lebowski go while Bunny's sitting in this wheelchair? Has he brought a spare along? Or oh yeah, no, he's he's got his regular. Has he got a self-propelled wheelchair? I'm not not sure what he's got in the film. But yeah, he's got another chair. What does he do? Tow it up there? They've got an innocuous van to transport all this stuff in. <laughs> Flowers by Irene, yeah? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right. That's all my questions. Any others? No. No. I wouldn't worry about preparing a film this week, guys. <laughs> okay, turn up. <laughs> Just to let you down gently. <laughs> Okie dokie. Lebowski is struggling to make ends meet, and his wife is putting a strain on his financial resources granted to him by his daughter Maud. The benefits of being married to a pretty young thing have worn thin and he is tired of a constant demand for more money. How is he to rid himself of this money-grabbing burden? Lebowski receives the dude at his mansion, as per the film. The dude, seeking replacement rug, etc. But before the dude has a chance to make his exit, a thought comes to him. Lebowski offers to pay for a replacement rug of the dude's choosing. As a laid-back fellow he is, his dudeness accepts. Lebowski adds a caveat to his offer. A sweetener. He cannot keep up with his significantly younger missus, so would the dude show his wife a good time on the town to pretend he is some eccentric rich man who is looking for company while in town? Lebowski promises all expenses paid and $1,000 thrown on top for his troubles. Oh, man, look. I don't know, man. Dude has his business to attend to says the dude. Make it a thousand, dude. My sweet pea is worth every penny. Okay, Lebowski, I like the way you do business. Well, she's outside, by the pool. Go make your introductions. But don't let on, you're under my order, you hear, dude? And one more thing. If she propositions you, you are to agree to anything she offers you. As a man of limited functions, I'm sure you can understand. Oh, yeah, man, say no more. Knowing that his wife is a person of low moral fibre, motivated purely by money, Lebowski is certain that being with a purported millionaire for an evening will evoke the kind of response he is looking for. Later that night, as the dude squires Bunny around town, Brand is following closely, waiting for the opportune moment. After Bunny has told the dude she'll suck his cock for $1,000, he obliges to drop his trousers in Lebowski's limo, when Brandt appears and takes opportunistic pictures. Armed with the photographic evidence, Lebowski kicks Bunny out of his mansion and files for annulment on the grounds of adultery. With Bunny gone, he is free from being accountable for her debts and further insufferable demands for more cash. One down. Lebowski then turns to his future income problems. To embezzle the money he needs from the family charity, he announces that the charity will build a summer camp retreat for troubled kids. Construction projects are often speculative involve large sums of money and it is relatively easy to inflate costs due to the apparently poor delivery performance. Claiming for grossly overinflated construction costs through the books, 
Lebowski is constantly skimming off the top, cooking the books so that as much of the excess money lands in his own pockets as possible. The construction is beset by delays, a fire and overspends until eventually the project is abandoned due to the charity running out of money. Maud, beside herself with disdain for her incompetent father, puts this all down to another example why you should not be involved in any kind of organisation, charity or otherwise. With his coffers now brimmed to the max, Lebowski is satisfied that his troubles are far behind him. Two down. The house of cards falls like dominoes. Checkmate. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's pretty good. A lot of ideas I toyed with myself, and I'll tell you why I abandoned them. Because I realised if Lebowski tried to divorce Bunny, it'd take you know less than the talents of a skilled divorce lawyer like Miles Massey. He's not, get, he's not, he's not getting a divorce, he's getting an annulment. They can't have an annulment after they've been married that long. They've not been married very long. How do you know that? Because it says it in the film. I don't think you can get an annulment that easily. But anyway, she's get she's getting alimony. That's what I'm saying. He's he's not getting a good deal out of that. Not not, not if she's on the grounds of adultery. Yeah, she'd yeah. get nothing. But any lawyer worth their salt could get her something by saying that she was only doing this because she was desperate for money. Objection! Objection! You're on a speculation. This is going far off into legal touchy that I have no idea <laughs> yeah. about. So uh, Speculation. In all the films I've seen, adulterers don't get any alimony. Have you not seen the Coen brothers' Intolerable Cruelty? Because they do. Yeah, I don't know. And how long have those people been married for? How, you don't know how long exactly Bunny and the Big Lebowski have been married. She leaves the parents' house like a year before or something well, like that. Well, there you go. You can't get an annulment so after a year. It's crazy. Well, you, you bring up the law that says I can't. Well, that's not on me. The onus is on you to prove that you can. I deliberately went from divorce to an annulment because a divorce takes longer and obviously she's stand to possibly get something out of it, whereas an annulment is basically saying this is a sham marriage. We want it finished now. So I liked it as an idea anyway, Turner. And uh, you mentioned yeah. there would be a fire at the camp. Is that something that the Globowski would uh, orchestrate himself? Yep. He just get Brandt to do his dirty work for him again. Could you quickly just add lib that that conversation? How would the Big Lebowski give that order to Brandt? Here you go, Brandt is a can of petrol. Go and put it on fire. <laughs> Good. Don't forget the matches. He doesn't. He doesn't micromanage. He doesn't. You know, go too far into the details. He lets Brandt get on with it himself. Yeah. Well, the main thing for Lebowski to do is to grossly overinflate the costs, so he can he can take the money off the top. Uh, and whatever the construction company is charging, obviously he's paying their bills, but then he's writing his books. So, so he's doing the classic like money laundering uh, operation. But the the fire is just another thing to right. to overinflate the costs, and it can it could be anything. They could say, oh, we you know we put it down to an electrical fire, or somebody's dropped a tab somewhere, mm-hmm. or something's fallen over. He can make it. It being a big construction site, he can basically work it to how whatever ends he he sees fit. Understood. Craig? So here's your grounds for annulment. You and your spouse are closely related. Either spouse was under 16 at the time of marriage. Either spouse was already married at the time of marriage. You did not properly consent to marriage, e.g. you were drunk or coerced. Your spouse had a sexually transmitted disease when you got married or was pregnant with someone else's child when you got married. You can't get an annulment. Good day, sir! Is that the US one, or is that UK law? US. Ooh. She was, uh, she was under. She wasn't she fifteen? Doesn't don't say. So. I don't think so. I thought she was like ran away from folks and it's like got a picture of her in high school at the end, didn't she? I assume she's an adult. Otherwise, otherwise Jesus would be hanging around. You've gone for to very extreme lengths to uh, try and sort of disqualify my uh, plan there. So I'm eagerly awaiting to uh, shit all over yours. <laughs> Without any further ado, Craig. Like that of the nihilists who seize upon Bunny's disappearance as a chance to clumsily attempt to extort a ransom, the Big Lebowski's crime is one of opportunity, and one that couldn't fully coalesce until after his meeting with the Duke. Prior to this encounter, he may have had only the motive and not the means to embezzle his family's urban achievers fund and rid himself of his promiscuous and profligate young wife. The dude is the final piece of the puzzle, a convenient patsy slacker, seemingly bereft of ambition or guile. Lebowski's undoing, notwithstanding Bunny's inevitable reappearance, is in underestimating both the dude's intelligence and his willingness to abide. The dude's association with Walter would perhaps be the biggest surprise to Lebowski. 
one of the original authors of the Port Curran Statement, with its anti-war sentiment and call for tolerance of communist ideology, spending his nights bowling with a Vietnam vet, is, on the face of it, an odd coupling. Had Lebowski taken the time to better understand the dude's drive, perhaps he would have seen him in a different opportunity. The dude could have become the poster child for Lebowski's little urban achievers, with the big Lebowski funding the dude's education through art college, something Maud would have difficulty objecting to. Following his graduation, Lebowski could further fund the dude's experimental art film, an erotic exploration of the link between sex and bowling, starring Carl Hungus and Bunny. Distributing the film through Jackie Treehorn, Lebowski would reap the lucrative returns of the burgeoning 90s pornography renaissance, while Bunny would be too busy shagging her way around LA like her namesake. Well, first thing I'll say is half of that plan was basically you describing the movie and so? what the problem was. And then the other half was basically saying somebody who's who's notoriously lazy is all of a sudden going to go to university for an education and then work for a living when it's clearly... Sounds like you don't know much about art college. Yeah, but it sounds like you don't know much about this film. <laughs> um, doesn't the dude say he did go to college, actually, in the film? He did. Yeah. It was it was students who wrote the Port Huron statement. Yeah, but he's not he's not in college anymore, and he's a man of leisure, isn't he? Art college is notoriously a leisurely subject. That was okay. the reason I picked it. In fact, it's one of the recurring jokes in Red Dwarf that Lister, the ultimate bum, is an art college graduate. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it seems to me that the dude went to university and uh, mm-hmm. didn't really try very hard. So what do you think would would change his mind this time? Maud. He's got an interest in art now and he's been hanging around David Thewlis's giggling little uh, character. He's He's had his erotic dream about Maud, you know. So he's suddenly got inspiration in his life that he hasn't had before. And he's also being given the means by the big Lebowski that he wouldn't have probably gone out and sought on his own. But because the dude abides, he rolls with things. If somebody says to him, I'll put you through art college, you'd be like, fucking hey, man, why not? I've got nothing else going on. It's fine. He'll just do it. See what happens. I think that's why most people get into making porn. <laughs> see what happens. Just go to art college yeah. and then just end up in porn. The opportunity came along. <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> all right. Well, let's see how this conversation would play out. Uh, Gaz, I'd like to, you to play the dude. Uh, okay. Craig, I'd like you to play the big Lebowski. That hardly seems fair. Convince the dude to go to... Gaz can say whatever the fuck he wants. <laughs> <laughs> well, he, he knows he hasn't won this week, so don't worry about that. That doesn't mean he won't enjoy <laughs> fucking ruining my thing. <laughs> let's just see how this plays out. Well, Mr Lebowski, I'd like to give you an opportunity to be one of my little urban achievers. I'm going to fully fund you to uh, have a, a rollicking good time in art college. You can, of course, continue to court my daughter Maud and I'll I'll fund any uh, art movies you want to make. And all I ask in return is that you, you employ uh, my good lady wife uh, and keep her, keep her nose clean. What do you say, uh, dude? Fucking A. Hey. <laughs> See, Marvelous. See how it worked. <laughs> that was that was beautiful. That was beautiful. I think Gaz was definitely channeling the dude there. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was a great impression, Craig. Well done. Thanks. All right, that's given me a lot to think about. Some absolutely diabolical schemes there, but there can only be one winner. A quick recap of the schemes before I announce. First, we had Gaz's plan. He suggests that the big Lebowski invests in a sports wheelchair, arranges a clandestine meeting with Bunny somewhere up in the Hollywood Hills, and have Brant uh, sabotage the uh, wheelchair. And uh, he then convinced Bunny to take a a walk in his shoes, so to speak. Obviously, there was a big flaw in that, um, which has slimmed Gaz's chances of winning somewhat. Next up was Turner, who came up with an interesting two-step plan. The first to uh, to annul the marriage, 
the second to uh, to cook the books to embezzle money through a, a summer camp scheme. And then we had Craig's plan, which is to put the dude through art college and get him to uh, start making some art house uh, skin flicks. Craig, I was very impressed with the way you played the Big Lebowski. That kind of tipped the needle in your favour somewhat. But this week I'm going to have to go with Turner's plan. Congratulations. Muchas gracias. Like legal wranglings aside, I thought the two-step plan was uh, was diabolical and also very believable. I really like the um, the idea of, of Brandt taking the photos. I think that's something he'd definitely do, as opposed to being mechanically minded enough to sabotage a wheelchair. Oh, <laughs> do you know what? I've just thought of another whole... Uh, see, I'm going to I'm gonna blow your plan out of the water now. Brandt's not allowed to watch no. Bunny sucking the dude's dick. She specifically says that he has to pay to watch. <laughs> Shit. You just, uh, you've just unraveled uh. it. Unraveled the whole fucking thing. <laughs> let's hope your pick for next week isn't any kind of legal drama. No, let's let's hope you actually watch next week's film. Lol. <laughs> All right, so, so what have you picked for us for next week? Next week, lads, I have picked the film that I don't think any of us have seen. Oh, shit. Uh, I am going to pick 1955's The Night of the Hunter. <laughs> Did it in university. It's good. Oh, Robert Mitchum. He's the evil preacher. Oh, right, yeah. No, yeah, I have seen it. It's With love and hate. Yeah, yeah, I... yeah. All right. Well, that's it for another week. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, hit subscribe so you never miss an episode. And why not prove to yourself how much influence you have over your friends by getting them to listen to the show? We'll get more listeners and you'll get the unparalleled rush of controlling another human being. It's win-win. Head over to Twitter and Instagram at DiabolicalPod throughout the week to tear apart our pitiful plans and tell us how you do better. Join us next week when we'll be talking drivel about the Night of the Hunter. And remember, if you can't be good, be careful. Four. Have Brunt disable the magnetic brakes and disconnect the steering pins from the wheel charm airs. What? Wheel charm? Wheel. <laughs> Fuck. <I'll be> <laughs> <laughs> Wheel charm as Jeez, Louise. It sounded like a Star Trek solution. <laughs> have you run it through that translator again, have you? <laughs> <laughs>